All right. Get ready for a wild ride. Yeah. You've handed me this book, Mind and Tissue, by Ray Pete. And let me tell you, it's a D-U-Z-Y. But in the best way possible, trust me, this deep dive into Soviet brain science is going to completely change the way you think about, well, thinking. You know, what I find fascinating about Pete's book is how he highlights this fundamental difference in the way Soviet scientists approach their work. It wasn't just about detached observation for them. Yeah, he talks about how their Marxist framework really shaped their whole scientific perspective. Exactly. While Western science often strives for this kind of pure objectivity science for science's sake, Soviet scientists saw knowledge as inherently connected to social progress. That's such a different way of looking at things. It's almost like they felt a responsibility to use their knowledge to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So how did that play out in their actual research? We'll take their concept of the orienting reflex. It's basically this innate drive we all have to explore to seek out new information and experiences. Like curiosity. Yes, exactly. But they saw it as much more than just a personality quirk. They believed this reflex was a fundamental driving force in human behavior, even stronger than things like hunger or self-preservation. Wow, that's intense. So they're saying that at our core, humans are wired to be explorers always pushing the boundaries of what we know and understand. Precisely. And they saw this constant drive for novelty and exploration as the key to personal and societal growth. Imagine that our brains are literally wired for progress. Okay, that is seriously cool. But they didn't stop there, did they? Pete goes on to talk about this wild idea of doubleness within the brain, almost like we have two internal selves shaping our perception of space and time. What's that all about? This is where things get really interesting. Pete points out how Soviet scientists believed that the two hemispheres of the brain weren't just mirror images, but actually worked together to create a kind of internal doubleness. So it's not just that one side is logical and the other is creative, like we always hear. Right, it's much more nuanced than that. They believed this doubleness was essential for how we perceive depth, both literally in our visual field and metaphorically in our understanding of the world. So it's like how our two eyes work together to create a 3D image. We need both perspectives to experience the world fully. Exactly. And just like we need both eyes to see clearly, they believe that both hemispheres of the brain contribute to a richer, more complete understanding of reality. Wow, so this doubleness is actually hardwired into how we perceive the world. That makes me think about how often we limit ourselves to just one perspective, one way of thinking. Yeah, and what's fascinating is that they didn't just apply this concept of doubleness to our physical senses, but also to things like our experience of time and even our understanding of ourselves. They believed this inner duality was a fundamental aspect of the human experience. This is blowing my mind already, and we haven't even gotten to the part about sexual energy and consciousness. Ah, yes, that's where things get even more interesting. Pete connects this doubleness with another radical idea from Soviet brain science, the idea that sexual energy isn't just about, well, sex. You have to elaborate on that one. Yeah. Because Pete throws in this quote from William Blake about casting seeds, and I have to admit, I'm a little lost. Okay, so get ready for this. Soviet scientists viewed sexual energy as a vital force that influences not just our bodies, but also our minds, our creativity, even our perception of reality. Wait, are you saying that our libido can actually expand our consciousness? Because that's a bold claim. It might sound wild, but remember, we're stepping outside the box of traditional Western thought here. In the Soviet perspective, sexual energy wasn't something to be repressed or compartmentalized. It was seen as a powerful force for growth and transformation. Okay, now I'm really curious to dive deeper into this. So how does this unconventional view of sexuality actually play out in their understanding of the brain? Well, they believe this vital energy influenced everything from our thought processes and emotional states to our sleep patterns and even our ability to heal. It's all connected. Wow, we're really starting to see just how different their perspective was. Okay, so we've got exploration, doubleness, sexual energy. Where does sleep fit into all of this? Because Pete had some pretty wild things to say about that, too. This is where things get really intriguing. You see, Soviet scientists didn't view sleep as simply a time for the brain to rest and recharge. They saw it as something much more active and powerful. Yeah, active. In what way? Active. In what way? Well, they believe that during sleep, the brain isn't just passively restoring itself. It's actually working hard to... Um, integrate new information, make connections, and e even heal the body. Okay, so it's not just about catching Zs. It's like our brains are doing some serious overtime while we sleep. 
Exactly. And they took this idea very seriously. Pete even talks about this experiment they did with a 17-year-old dog. Imagine a dog that old, practically on its last legs. They basically put it into a sleep coma for six months straight. Six months. That sounds more like a sci-fi movie than a scientific experiment. What happened? Okay. That the poor thing even survived. Not only did it survive, but get this, the dog woke up practically a puppy. It was like they had turned back the clock on its aging process just by extending its sleep. Whoa. Okay, that's both amazing and a little creepy at the same time. I'm both incredibly intrigued and slightly terrified to sleep now. But seriously, that's wild. Do they explain how that's even possible? Well, they believe that sleep allows the brain to enter this deeply restorative state where it can focus on repair and rejuvenation. Remember their emphasis on the orienting reflex. All that exploring and learning can take a toll on the nervous system. They saw sleep as crucial for restoring that depleted energy and allowing the body to heal itself. So they're basically saying that if we could just hack our sleep, we could unlock some incredible healing potential within ourselves. That was certainly their belief. They saw sleep deprivation as a major contributor to all sorts of health problems, both physical and mental. And they believed that by prioritizing sleep and creating the right conditions for deep restorative rest, we could enhance our brain function, boost our immune system, and even slow down the aging process. Okay, that is seriously making me rethink my whole relationship with sleep. But let's shift gears a bit. We've talked about exploration, doubleness, sexual energy, sleep. Where does consciousness fit into all of this? Because from what I understand, Pete links all of this back to consciousness, right? Absolutely. And this is where things get really mind bending. Pete draws a connection between the Soviet brain science and Carl Prebrom's holographic model of consciousness, but suggests the Soviets took it even further with their idea of a tissue hologram. Okay, I have to admit that one went a little over my head. Tissue hologram, what does that even mean? Yeah, it's a complex concept, but essentially they believed that consciousness isn't just something that happens in the brain, but that it's actually woven into the very fabric of the brain itself. Remember how they saw the orienting reflex as this drive towards greater understanding and connection with the world? They believed that consciousness itself is a reflection of that interconnectedness, a kind of hologram created by the complex interplay of neurons and energy within the brain. So instead of thinking of the brain as a computer that processes information, they're saying it's more like a projector, creating a holographic image of our reality based on this web of interconnected experiences and energy. That's a great way to put it. And this idea ties back to their belief that we're not just passive observers of the world, but active participants in shaping our own reality. Wow. So we're not just brains in a vat after all. This is heavy stuff, but it's also incredibly empowering. Exactly. And you know, one of the most striking things about this Soviet perspective is their unwavering optimism about human potential. Pete contrasts them with some Western thinkers who argued that science is nearing its end, that we're approaching the limits of what we can know. But the Soviets saw it differently. They believed there was always more to discover, right? Just like with their research on the brain, they were constantly pushing the boundaries, looking for new ways to understand this incredibly complex organ. Precisely. While some saw limits, the Soviets saw endless possibilities for growth and evolution, both for our understanding of the world and for ourselves as individuals. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here, from the power of the orienting reflex to this wild idea of consciousness as a tissue hologram. It's a lot to wrap our heads around. But what does it all mean for us, for the average person who's just trying to navigate life in the 21st century? What can we actually do with all of this information? I think the real value of exploring these unconventional perspectives is that they challenge our assumptions and open up new ways of thinking about ourselves and the world. They encourage us to question the status quo, to look for connections, and to never stop exploring. It's like we've been handed a new lens through which to view reality, a lens that reveals hidden depths and possibilities we never even imagined. Exactly. And while some of these Soviet theories might seem a bit out there, I think there's a lot we can learn from their approach their curiosity and their belief in the boundless potential of the human mind. It's like they're saying, hey, don't be afraid to think differently, to challenge the status quo, to explore the unknown. And that's a message I can definitely get behind. But Pete doesn't stop at these theoretical concepts. He goes on to talk about some very specific applications of Soviet brain science, particularly in the realm of therapy. That's right. And this is where things get really interesting because their approach to therapy was just as unconventional as their approach to research. Oh, how so? 
How so? Well, remember how they viewed the brain as this dynamic, interconnected system constantly adapting to its environment, fueled by this vital energy? They believe that in order to heal the brain, you had to address those energy imbalances, not just treat the symptoms. That's a totally different perspective from what we're used to in Western medicine, where it's often all about pills and symptom management. Exactly. Pete talks about how they used things like ATP, creatine phosphate, even progesterone to directly boost brain energy and function. It's like they were treating the brain as a kind of battery that needed to be recharged. So it wasn't just about fixing what was broken, but about giving the brain the tools it needed to heal itself. Right. And they didn't just focus on biochemical interventions. They also incorporated things like light therapy, magnetic fields, even specific diets designed to promote brain health. They believed that the brain's energy was influenced by everything from the light we're exposed to, to the foods we eat. It sounds incredibly holistic, almost like a kind of energy medicine. That's a good way to put it. They saw the brain as a reflection of our whole experience, a constant interplay of energy environment and our thoughts and emotions. And that's why they believed that by creating the right conditions, we could actually influence those energy processes and promote healing. This makes me think about how often we compartmentalize our health. We go to the doctor for a physical ailment, the yeah. therapist for our emotional issues, and we never connect the dots. But maybe that's what's missing. It's definitely something to consider. And it ties back to their belief in the brain's plasticity, its ability to adapt and change even in the face of significant challenges. They saw the brain as this incredibly powerful engine for healing and growth, if only we knew how to unlock its full potential. That's a really powerful thought. And it leaves me with a question. If our brains are constantly adapting and responding to our experiences, what possibilities for growth and transformation are we overlooking? That's a question that each of us needs to ponder. And it's a reminder that exploring these unconventional perspectives isn't just about learning new facts. It's about expanding our understanding of what's possible. I started this deep dive feeling a bit overwhelmed by the density of Pete's book. But now I feel like I've been handed a whole new set of tools to navigate the world, a whole new set of lenses through which to view my own experience. And that's the magic of these unconventional perspectives. They challenge our assumptions, broaden our horizons, and ultimately empower us to live more fully and creatively. This has been a mind-blowing journey, and I'm definitely going to be revisiting Mind and Tissue with a fresh perspective. Thank you for guiding me through this fascinating deep dive into the world of Soviet brain science. It's been a pleasure. And remember, this is just the beginning. There's so much more to explore and discover in this fascinating field of knowledge.